Pod Pick Podcast. Picks and Perspective with Chris Johnson. Yngwie. How you doing, man? Great, man. Good to see you. All right. Peachy. Good Peachy. morning. Yeah. Is that the home studio there that you're sitting in? Yes. Man, is, I is like it, seeing that, that gold record right behind you. It's pretty darn cool. <laughs> well, you know what's even more crazy? Huh. This album went to, to fucking Billboard charts. Congratulations. Crazy, man. You know what the last time I had an album on the Billboard charts? 1991. Really? Yes. Been that we, long? Yeah. Except if you, if you, my, you know, Blue Lightning, the Blues album, that got mm-hmm. on the chart too, but I didn't even notice. <laughs> but, but, um, it's, it's, listen, all, all rock and roll, all guitar playing, that no one goes on the Billboard chart. That's like, uh, Lady Gaga territory. Top right. 100. Not to, 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 not to 200, top 100. So I'm pretty stoked about that. As you should be, as you should be. I mean, the new album, congratulations on it. Uh, Wolves at the Door is an incredible record start to finish. So um, the I, fact that you're that it hit the charts too and you're happy with how it turned out, I mean, triple win. That, that, that is the whole, that's what's so rewarding when you absolutely, I did no fucking compromise, you know, nothing. I mean, this is what I want to do. You take it or leave it. And then still works. Yeah, yeah I'm very that, happy. That's the YJM attitude. Like, take it or leave it, baby. This is who I am. I know, but, it, you know, th- th- there was always in, in the past, you know, you had to be a little bit, no, but about radio, this and that, whatever. Mm. Um, man, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to chop it up with me because, uh, you're one of the most legendary guys on the planet uh, when it comes to guitar, and you've inspired so many people. I mean, you might even be directly responsible for bands like like Dragon Force and Symphony X, like, and and uh, uh, probably countless others that have like followed in the footsteps. I know a lot of my friends and in, uh, in the industry that I've worked with that always when I interview them. They go, oh, but then there's Ingve Malmsteen, you know, like he's the guy. Like you know, Andy James, my buddy. Uh, you probably know who Andy is. He he has you know cited you multiple times. You know he's like, oh, you know, if it wasn't for Ingve, I don't know, like I would be doing what I'm doing. You know, so uh, it's also it's so exciting to have you on the podcast and have an album out currently that hit the charts. Like we just discussed, wow. like that's all like really cool to see happening for you. You know, so Thank you. I, I'm really excited. Thank you very much. I also have a big, big tour coming up. November, mm. December, United States. It's, it's, uh, it's on my site there. The John Five opening up. It's going to be great. Oh, John Five is amazing. Yeah, what a great player. Yeah. That's cool. So what in the process of making this last record, it seems like you've had maybe a little more time than normal to like put together an album. Is that true? And is that is that something that you feel like aided you in being able to like do everything the way you wanted to, no compromise? Well, the, the, the huge difference is there was a continuous studio time. Mm. Whereas what I've done last, I don't know, many years now, so I, I record something, I write something, I go on the road, I go back out, I come back in, you know. So the time from start to finish Maybe just about the same, but there was no interruption, none. Mm. <clears throat> and one thing, when you're in here, I've learned from many years of experience is that you need to know when to walk away. Because That's if right. you don't play with inspiration, if you don't perform with inspiration, it's no good. So in other words, oh, I want to play. Uh, I want to play that over and over and over and over and over and over. No, it's if it doesn't have because every infliction, every little nuance of everything that I play, even if it's written, it's not the same. You know, solos are hundred percent improvised, and that's the tricky part in the studio because you you have to improvise the solo 
and have all inspiration and all the fluidity, you know, and it's not, you can't just push a button and have that, you know, it's, it, but whereas live, of course, you have all the inspiration from the audience. So, but, but that's the thing. What I did do with my time on this was that I would take every idea. I had like 80 or 90 songs on the computer here. Um, <laughs> and I would listen to them in a the car. I would drive around all over the place, just top down and just, you know, do my thing. Top foot down, top, top down, foot down type thing. <laughs> and uh, that's what I do, you know. I'm a crazy Ferrari person. And so I would hear things completely different than I would in here. And that was from the beginning of writing it to mixing it. So when I wrote it, I might have had an idea, this is the main theme, and then something, I would like add something, and all of a sudden that becomes the main theme. Or I have a chorus, and I would say, no, 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 that chorus should be in the beginning. Stuff like that, you know, like arrangements, stuff like this. And then when it came to solos, so I did a solo, when I do a solo, I don't listen back to it. I just do the solo, and I say to the engineer, okay, let's do some vocals, let's do some bass, let's do some keyboard, let's do whatever. And then do another song solo, man, whatever. Not over and over and over. And over. That's like the key for me. So when I listen to it, maybe a couple of days later, I'll hear, I'll hear the solo for the first time, really. Mm. And, 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 and it's not, it's, it was improvised when it was recorded. So it wasn't, oh yeah, I'm gonna have to perform these notes. No, it was composed and played, improvised at that time. So I would hear it and I would say, up until there, it's, really good in that key change in f sharp phrygian i'll do one I, i'll drop in there and i do another take and we'll see what gets better tomorrow whatever and then after i have a solo i feel it's great i listen to it and after when i'm improvising the solos if you listen to the record you'll hear melodies in the solos that have harmonies on them but they're in solos you know what happens is that these melodies were improvised but i hear them i go oh i put a third to that so mm -hmm. it's written, but it's not. And that to me mm -hmm. is why I, after 40 years, I'm still doing this. And I'm still loving this. I'm still getting off on this. And I'm still getting excited about it because <clears throat> I've learned how to make it so that it doesn't feel, okay, I'm going to play these notes now and I have to be perfect. Mm. Which in a bizarre way, I could do that. You know, I have mm. an autopilot thing or I could uh, write, for instance, also when it comes to writing even more important right now ask me to do i could play uh, oh let's do a content western style song okay coming back in five minutes <laughs> i'll have something for you sure but that's not gonna be something that i'm gonna jump up and down around about it's just gonna be something that it's there it's gonna be okay but when things come to me from i don't know where i've been downstairs and i've been watching tv whatever and, I, and I'm playing guitar, and whoa, and I run up here and I record it. Those mm -hmm. moments, those things, <clears throat> when you accumulate all of them, and then you take them, and you make, I'm going to make this into that, I'm going to do that. And then when you have time, you can really, <clears throat> uh, not analyze, that's the wrong word. You can let it evolve into mm -hmm. what's going to be the end thing. And in the past, when I made records, like I'm talking many years ago, I would always have a studio, but not like a big ass studio like this, but like a you know a little room, whatever. I'll write things on a 16 track or whatever, something like this. And that would be, I would take that to a rehearsal room and I would put it to the van and I'd say like, hey, play this parts and then we rehearse it. And then we go to a studio and we cut the drums and then we cut the bass and then we put the guitars and the, and the solos and the vocals. But then halfway through I go, oh, shit, I need a 16 bars of this. And I wanted this chorus to be double here and, and single there. Well, too late, pal. Mm. Because back then, you had everything simply code. And it was basically what happened was the, 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 the spontaneous beauty of when the piece came to you for the first time was rehashed and rehashed and rehashed and rehashed and rehashed until it became recorded. Whereas in here, when it comes to me, like the beginning of the album, the arpeggio of a wolf at the door. I was sitting by the TV. I go, oh, this is cool. I ran up. I recorded. it. That's what's on the album. Wow. I, I love it. how it opens. I love that part. 
recorded five minutes after I wrote it. It's not redone later. No, that's the beauty of, of having this set up, number one, but also you have the time because that song wasn't going to start like that. The song was going to start a different way. <laughs> but And I, then I said, oh, maybe I should put a Paganini and I, that, no, maybe I should have the G minor part in the solo section. No, no, I should do the Paganini part. Yeah, but that should be transposed A minor, blah, 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 blah. Um, then I go, oh, yeah, the, 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 on the snare, that should be a nine, nine, Beretta 92 9 millimeter gunshot there. And, I, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. So wow. the, that you want to do, you have the time and you have the spontaneous way of doing it. So I'm extremely happy with I had a great time doing it. It was it never became boring, you know. That's it's so cool. So what I part of what I hear you saying too is that you're like super stoked on where technology is at, having the studio at home, being able to run in and do say, you know, your off the cuff uh ideas can get captured high quality and then then used in the final recording, not just a demo thing where you're like, oh here, let me show you the thing, then I'll I'll, I'll perfect it later. You can get the thing right in the when the inspiration is hot and that, and then that gets included in the final product and so that your final product has all these different um improvisation like uh key flow moments versus having this uber rehearsed thing that it maybe feels a little lifeless is that where i'm getting from you right here's the thing i about 25 years ago it was back in the day when you had when you were signed to a label that would give you a bunch of money to make a record. You would take this money and you would hire rental cars and hotel rooms and and uh, studio time and flying engineers and all this shit, right? I said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm spending this money on this designing and building a studio. That was 1995. Mm. Two inch tape machines. The whole <laughs> now you right, right. You can't see it here, but I have like. All the, the tube gear, I got the Neve, I got the, uh, I got all that, the original Focusrite, that, not Focusrite you buy now at Kmart, but like the, the ones the that- Old the, school, yeah. The Neve and the, 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 the 1176s and tube gear and everything here. I have all this stuff that I run the guitars from. And and I there used to be like a, um, a maid's, like a, like a servant's quarter. This is my colonial home, yeah. As it used <laughs> to be, a different department. I said, I'm going to put that's going to Marshall Stacks. Going to so I put all the Marshall Stacks in there and I wired everything, microphones, everything out all the way up here and all the heads are here. So I pushed, I turned the Marshall on. It's going through the whole chain like that. Perfect sound. I don't have to worry about miking anything. It's done. All right. So I've had that since a long time, but now I have it so that, you know, I could very easily put these segments that I might do off like right like right now I could use mm -hmm. that because it's not something always a good idea I'll do it again mm -hmm. you know what I mean mm -hmm. so it's it's I don't know it's, it's a long story but um it it, it is it's an, it's a miles apart because for instance I would do like trilogy or so, albums like that they were all you know written in some little eight track studio first and then played and then we'll go in the room and we'll do the drums and you know how it was back then and to me sure. the songs feel great but they don't sound as inspired as they were when i wrote them mm. whereas yeah, on this that all fresh baked <laughs> yeah yeah that's what i that's that's what i hear i and it feels fresh to me too so let's i'm glad that that's that's translating as somebody that didn't know that was your process. You know, I was sitting here going, wow. I mean, I mean, I really appreciate all the, uh, uh, the, the, the classics, you know, from rising forests and all, all this stuff, uh, trilogy and everything too. But the, to hear this one all these years later and to feel like, Hey, the quality is so high, the writing's really high. And to hear you say, Oh man, I've been collecting all these hot takes, all these hot moments, you know? And, and so, that actually makes me curious about this. You say that the solos are all, um, you know, pretty improvised. And I love this concept of like doing, doing one and then moving on. hundred percent, hundred percent. I know what key is it in. I know what key <laughs> is in. I know that. And I know that in F sharp Frigian that you play these notes, but that not one single start, middle, finish, nothing is like, oh yeah, I'm going to start like this. 
then go like that, nothing. Mm. And <clears throat> by the way, when I go on stage, I do the same thing. I, 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 have, I don't play the same solo. It's every night I go on, it's, it's a blank slate. Wow. And that's, that's why it's like, uh, that's why it's challenging. That's why it's exciting. That's why I'm still doing it after all these years. If I would just go and be a fucking jukebox and play everything note for note, I don't think I would do it. I think, I think, no. Wow, there, man. There's no challenge in that. There's no excitement. You just, you just became, I mean, you were already a hero, but this is makes me like, like that much more enamored with you and your, your approach because, um, I mean, that's, that's like living in the moment. That's more Zen is to approach tonight on this stage with this particular sound. Even it's the same equipment and if you're the same dude, but you're a little different than you were last night. Right. So tonight you're feeling a little bit different. You had a different conversation with your crew, you know, also this every room you play in every every hall mm. sounds different and if when, it, if when it's a different if it's a really dry room which i don't like i tend to play <laughs> I, I play always fast but mm. if it's still more live i let it sing more it's crazy because when it, when it, i can't the notes can't sing there's like no natural reverb you know and it's really mm -hmm. weird so i play differently that way but a couple of years ago i recorded two nights in a row, Tampa and Orlando, Florida. And I put them out. If you listen to mm. those two nights, the same songs, Far Beyond the Sun, Black Star, whatever they are on there, not one note's the same. Wow. In the solos. That's so, so cool. It, it's, not like I don't, it's not like I came up to the solo in the studio and then improvised on stage. No, improvised in the studio and on stage. So it, it's mm. never the same. And I guess, you know, sometimes maybe that can be bad because sometimes you might suck, you know what I mean? But I want to I want to <laughs> be I want to be taking that chance or rather, you know. Man, that's but that is a that is a cool risk and um I, if you don't take those risks, then you won't you'll never find out what's on the other side of living in the moment that way, right? So like for those players that are purely stuck in like I've got to recreate what was on the album and I wrote it like this and it's got to be like this um they'll never know what the alternate versions really are because they're not exploring it they're not actually meeting it in the moment in the same way right you know you know, so here's something crazy that a, a, a lot of people first of all it's, it's hilarious because i remember when i first came on the scene years ago <laughs> many years ago a lot of people come up to me and go man dude i can't believe you don't have a distortion on your guitar I have more gain. I have more gain than a fucking nuclear power plant on my set, <laughs> you know. But I, I like to play it so the notes come out clear, you know. Mm. And that's that, that. That's the impression I got. It was really fun. Number number one. Number two. Related, but not, yeah, a lot of people don't seem to know that the great composers, Mozart, Bach, Vivaldi, were improvisers. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, I don't know that. I don't know. They that. were. They would really? improvise. If if um, Paganini, he was an improviser. Uh, so the, it, improvisation is the genesis of composition. He improvised to compose, because improvisation is composition. <laughs> mm. And if what they had to do back then, they had no tape recorders, obviously, so they had to write down something. Oh, they had main themes, of course, but then they had cadenzas you know, in the middle where, uh, almost like solos, they call it cadenza. Um, and they would be different performances. And then it would be basically cue, go back in. And when I composed my concerto suite for electric guitar and orchestra and E-flat minor, I had a 96 piece symphony orchestra and a 60 piece choir playing <laughs> my pieces, right? Mm -hmm. Which was sick. <laughs> <laughs> but I had this beautiful, this amazing conductor, and he did something called colaparte. It's a technical term, a classical term for follow the soloist. Mm. So he would stand here, conduct orchestra, and I would stand here, and he would look at me like this. And he would, after two rehearsals, he knew that when I did this, when I did this, I would do a certain infliction in, in, in the melody that he would let, there was uh, also Colaparte, call there's follow the soloist, but the rubato means not fixed tempo. 
So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, so basically, he was a really, really good one. A Japanese symphony. But, and I used to um, do a Levy from Atlanta Symphony in Prague. Um, he was amazing too. But what I'm trying, what the point I'm trying to say is that musicianship really is improvisation. Because otherwise, you're just typewriting a notation. You, somebody note, noting something and you typing it down. It, mm-hmm. that, to me, that's not creative, you know? The, you, you have to write a new book every time. It's, it's, uh, it's hard to describe. But to get that freedom and to get that thing flow in the studio was always a, not a problem, but it was uphill battle for me, you know? Because I saw that red light go on and I knew that tape machine, the tape machine was not undo. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No undo. Thing? improvise solo right a you're limited in tracks and you can't undo right mm-hmm. so you say the engineer can't drop in there and he drops in a little late and what you what you drop in is is not better than you had there before then you back to square one it's like so on the legs of a table you know i didn't like that so that's that's the one thing uh with pro tools i i i, I feel completely fearless i feel like well if, if i fuck up it's not gonna be so bad, and if I do, I could fix that note maybe if I had to, which I mm-hmm. don't really want to do. But if I had to, it, it, at the expense like expense of not doing it completely, like a wily coyote jumping over a cliff, you know what I mean? Because I want mm-hmm. that. So that's that's my yeah. approach. What I do. You're, the feeling there's a there's a sense of uh, like I can tell if I didn't know anything about you and I just listened to you, I might actually go does this dude drive a ferrari <laughs> like, yeah. like I, I might say that because when i listen to the way you play and like it's it's like you it's like a, a uh it it's very accurate it's it's uh all these you know you know very well what you're up to you know it's obvious but like some of the lines are so long it's almost like I, it makes me think of um of like driving a fast car through a a a, a a bunch of badass turns, you know, and it's like the, the the scenery going by. It's like I can kind of feel that when I hear some of the big runs and the the way that you approach the thing, because it's like you said, you know, you got your foot on the gas and the top down and you're going right. Like there's a thing there that's happening and uh, it seems to translate. And and driving is an improvisation, too. Right. Driving. You never know what you're going to meet on the road exactly. And especially if you're on a new road. You know, yeah. Especially in You're this in response. So, um, <laughs> see, but you, you have to, I mean, the, the funny thing with, with, with the way I've always been when it, when it comes to this, it's ever since I can remember. I even mentioned in my book, Relentless, the, my memoir, the, uh, is that I never practiced. Hmm. Even when I was seven, eight years old, and I was playing, no one was listening, I didn't practice. Because I wanted to perform, and I would be that that like the I would be the person taking his performance in, although I'm the performer. So I would never give myself any break. It's like let's do let's do that over and over and over. No, never. I would go. I I need to come up with something now on the spot that blows my own mind right now, and I'd be relentless about it and really kind of hard on myself, say like, I suck. I didn't do anything that blew my mind today. You know, mm. kind of approaches that. That's like, that's crazy. You, you might want to try to blow other people's mind, but it not. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I did it then. And that's how I do it now. Mm. And what, what I, I, and I'm extremely self-critical, extremely. I don't cut any corners at all. And that's the, that's the tricky part. When you improvise and you play something free free form, it's not really true because it's within the mathematical boundary, really. You know, sure. it's, you know it, it is. But it's the combination. Uh, and you do that, you want to cut yourself a break, but if you do, you might not be on top. It's, it's a tricky mm. thing. And that's why I don't want to do over and over takes because I don't think they get better. They just get... You know, it's the difference. Like for instance, if I do vocals, I know the vocal melody, 
And it's not going to change that much. And I'm going to do it like, like I do stay. I can spend six hours on backing vocals because I just know that's what they're going to do. That those are the notes. And they, they, you put them in a layer and you do it like this. Great fun. A lot of fun. But when it comes to improvisation, solos, no. Mm. Do, you, do you have a, 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 a person or that, that inspired you in the early days to take this approach? Or was this something that just would naturally came about as you picked up the guitar? Yeah, here's, this is, you're probably going to laugh at this. Hmm. I, I, uh, when I grew up, I grew up in the 70s, a long time ago, <laughs> in Sweden. And in Sweden, there was two TV channels from 6 to 10 p.m., was three radio stations and they were all talk radio or uh, jazz or classical and then maybe pop uh, on the third one. There was two newspapers and then it was really nothing else. So I grew up in, in I was surrounded with mostly older people, older than me, I was the youngest, right? So they would go and buy Emerson, Lake and Palmer albums and they would go buy early Genesis and Deep Purple and stuff like this. And I heard all this stuff and I loved it. I thought it was fucking great, still do. You know, but it wasn't like I heard on the radio or saw on TV. So I didn't have like a mentor, so so to speak, in that sense. Plus, all the all the other parts of my family were classical. My, my uncle's uh, the royal, uh, tenor at the Royal Opera. You know, it was like, oh, he only does sing. You know, practice that stuff. And to me, mm -hmm. I didn't. Oh no, you know what I mean. So it wasn't. It, it wasn't something that I learned or something like that. It was just something that happened to my, my own personality. Didn't want to give me a break. I just wanted to, and this, I'm talking about when I started, when I was seven years old. Wow. I got my first one, I was guitar when I was five, but I started playing when I was seven. Um, that's Gene Hendrix on the news. And I just, that's, that's just what I wanted to do. But I was about 14 or so. I heard Van Halen. Mm. And I, I just loved the, the way, the, the rawness, and the, I don't give a fuck about that bad. I, I thought it was the greatest thing I ever heard. So but by then, I already, all I was into was classical music. You know, I've, I've moved, uh, it was all Bach and Paganini and Vivaldi. That's all it was. Plus, I was playing tuned down to C-sharp heavy metal stuff, you know, <laughs> before I think. I never heard what else do it before, but I used to do that all the time. We used to put a bass wow. string on lowest, lowest E. And I turn it, turn it down, and the, all marshals, of course. And I play all this you're, fast. That was pretty crazy. So you're turning back. to see it, what, what, what year, like in the 70s, Nine, you're saying? Or 80s? 1976, 75. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> and without knowing, I would, I would turn all the middle off. So it was like, like that, like, like all scooped sound. It was a weird. <laughs> I, used to, I don't know why I did that. I just thought it was fun for a while. And then I, went back to the flat again anyways so what i was gonna say was uh um i i was really into the whole thing of, of being a more of a live thing you know mm -hmm. and that's that i thought was brilliant with the first van Halen album too great inspiration man i i, I assumed that hendrix also probably had some sort of element in that because el because he, he always had kind of an open feeling in a way he played and he wasn't trying to nail everything the exact same way every time either. He was a very live player. My relationship with Jimmy is a little different than that. I hmm. saw him burn the guitar on TV. It was no music. Whoa. And that was, I, I just saw him smash up the guitar. They, 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 that was the clip they used, the Monterey Pop clip for the, mm -hmm. on the news. They died, he died that day. Man. And I said, oh, that's cool. And I started playing that same day. I picked up my guitar right from the hang on the wall. And that was, I was seven years old then. And so I didn't hear music there. And the first song I learned how to play was a, was a, a Swedish folk song called uh, the Bark Bread song. <laughs> like that. It's a harmonic minor, believe it or not. But that was the first mm. thing I learned to play on the guitar. And I would play 10, 10 hours a day. People say, what's wrong with this kid? What's wrong with this kid, you know? <laughs> and then when I was nine years old, I got Deep Purple Fireball. That starts mm -hmm. with double bass drums. It's the first thing I heard, like, like what the hell is this, you know? And uh, and then the, the classical thing came in. Like, well, by the time I was nine or 10, I was kind of like, 
title the the blues thing. Although I love the blues, I just me I felt like I want to go more notes. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I started listening to Bach and Vivaldi and and uh, stuff like this. And uh, but I love the hard sound, the double bass drums, the smoke machines, and the Marshall stacks. You know, still do that. Um, mm-hmm. they, it, that's how it became what it is. That's cool, man. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate the to, to hear that. Like, it was the day that you heard that Jimmy died that you picked the guitar up. You know, I, you saw him burn his guitar, and you're like, "That's it. I gotta play." I already had a guitar. On my fifth birthday, I got a violin on my fourth birthday, uh, a guitar on my fifth birthday, a trumpet on my sixth birthday. And they gave me, I didn't take guitar lessons, but I had lessons of other things that, you know. And uh, then on my, when I was seven, I saw on the news, him smashing the guitar up. And I had a guitar, just took it off the wall and started playing. I didn't know how to play. I started playing until the string broke off and then I just started next string. So this, I, I describe exactly how this happened in my book. but that's awesome so you know it's interesting through the years like you've made a a really uh you 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 kind of the legend of Ingve Malmsting precedes you you know like for being like uh an outspoken kind of bombastic personality in the guitar community I mean and I'm curious like is do you think that that's deserved overall like or is that something that uh or maybe you're misunderstood in that realm no i'm not misunderstood fuck you uh <laughs> i i listen when i came okay so i'm i was born in sweden although i'm like the the, the anti-swede because swedish mentality is very you know middle of the road don't 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 make any waves you know mm-hmm. keep the stuff don't don't stick out you know i'm the exact opposite i'm like a Everything I do, I want to do to the max. Otherwise, more is more, basically. Um, and when I grew up there, I found myself in a position where I had to really fight tooth and nail to get anything anywhere. Because everybody was trying to press me down like this. Mm. So when I came to the States, obviously, I wasn't polished or diplomatic in the sense where I, I knew what, where the, the certain etiquette was and so on. So I, I made some mistakes, saying some bad things, which I shouldn't have had done. But <clears throat> it was all a matter of a learning curve, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I kind of stuck with it a little bit like that. Um, I guess when you when you kind of like crawl yourself up, you, 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 you know, I guess it was just like a survival thing. You know, I, I felt like I needed to, really make it clear where I was and where, where I was coming from and so on. I don't know. So I probably very, very misunderstood a lot of ways. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, that, that's, that's kind of the, the, the thing I get from you, especially these days, seeing how you are in interviews and, 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 and here now, you know, it's like, um, there's a, there, I, it, you've had to be misunderstood and, and I'm sure that, or, you know, youth is a hell of a drug and it's in a, in and of itself. Right. Like, cause when we're young, um, we're like, man, I know every fucking thing, you know, and I'm fucking good, man. And I've been doing, putting in the work and like, did you even hear my fucking last album? Cause that shit is fire. And if I were you, I'd probably be feeling, you know, something similar because that takes a lot of work, a lot of dedication. It doesn't come overnight. Um, and so, and you've got, you obviously still 40 years later, have the fire in your belly to make dope ass music at the highest level. So like that's to me is a really interesting thing, you know, because when ego and when we we when we assert ourselves, it's kind of a double edged sword, right? Like we we rise up and we say, "Look at my so- look at my thing here, check me out, hear me roar." Also, you might burn a path, you know, uh, along the way. You might you know set a few other people on fire because you're on fire, and that's just the way it goes, right? <laughs> you might start a forest fire on accident. Well, I mean, they, <clears throat> this this could be a, a number. Of, actually, thinking of what you just said now, uh, I think also, unfortunately, there was a lot of people. I'm not talking about fans in the press now. I'm talking about people that I hired mm. because 1984, I started my solo career, and I like to express that meaning again: solo career. So. Mm-hmm. 
basically I was signed to a label. I was given a budget. So I gave paychecks to whoever I said play bass or drums or or I usually played bass, but whatever, you know, whatever they played, keyboards or vocals, whatever the hell they did. And I would write the parts and I would sing it, show, show it to them. And all of a sudden they thought they were in my, in my band. Mm. And that, when once you go on the road and you see a, a biggest, big, quite large success at the time, you know, a lot of those people came from a smaller background, so on. Uh, that could have also, they might have thought, you know, the funniest thing I ever heard with heard was like when people, he's hard to work with. <laughs> you don't work with me. You work for me. Mm. You know, and I might sound that, like that's the difference. It might like sound like an arrogant thing, but it's the truth. Case in point, Frank Zappa, Ian Anderson, people like that, they do the same mm. thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. That that's that's what people misunderstand. Sometimes they go, they don't understand that. And then, like, look, I love the Stones, the Purple, the Zeppelin. I love all these bands, Van Halen, bands, ACDC. That bands that started the guitar playing. He does that, and the drummer comes in, and and the singer sings his part, and he, together they make this amazing stuff. I love that. I think that's amazing. I can't work like that, and not only because it's not because I'm I'm trying to be egotistical or or the store. No, it's because I work like a painter or a writer. It's like it's not I, I can't call somebody up. Hey, dude, uh, I painted half of this painting. You want to come on finish the other half? <laughs> I I don't work like that. I I compose the whole symphony. I paint the whole painting. I write the whole book. Mm. And sometimes I would hire people to perform parts like in a movie. You know, and that's sometimes they, they, people totally misunderstand that. Because when you say Ingvar Malmsteen solo career, it really is. And the funny part is when I grew up in Sweden, when I was a little tyke, <clears throat> I had bands, uh, I formed the band Rising Force in 1978, not in 1984, 1978, I formed mm. the band Rising Force. He had every living bass player in the North Scandinavian countries, every living drummer that ever played drums in the Scandinavian countries, ever. But I was always there. I was a writer, singer, guitar player and mm. before then i had a band called powerhouse same thing there and right before then i had a band called power so i started putting these little bands together when i was a little kid i remember when i was in sec second grade i said to this kid uh, in, my, in my class i said hey uh i'm doing a gig on friday oh yeah yeah you gotta play the drums <laughs> well i don't play drums it's all right i'll show you well i don't have any drums it's okay i have a drum set you're playing the drums. And lo and behold, he was playing the drums on Friday in the school cafeteria. Where I, I said, I was, I was eight years old. I said, I'm going to do a gig here. And I was, <laughs> you know, and that's how I've been. My grandfather was mm. a drummer. So we had a drum set. I, I said, you play these drums. I show you how to bring do, bash, do. Just hold this down and let me solo over this. Amazing. Thought is Second that. grade. Changed. When I sent a cassette tape to, to Mike Varney's guitar player, 1982, it was a cassette tape where I played the drums, I played the bass, I played the keyboards, the guitars, and I sang everything. Because I had a recording studio. My uncle built a recording studio in the 50s that I got to use from the point I was like 13 or so. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I, I, I would do everything that's on that tape that was my ticket to America. It was all me playing all the parts, just like this. So wow. that's just the way I've always been. But when I came to America, you know, I was playing the game and I was like, you know, uh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do what you tell me to do, steal or whatever. Um, but when I came home from Japan in, in January 1984, they said, you have a solo deal. That's it. 
So I said, okay, I'll just pick it up where I, where I left it off in back in Stockholm in 82. Do, you'll start doing what you were doing in second grade, telling people, hey, you're playing drums, friend. Get over there. I don't know how to play. I'll show you how to play drums. Just get on the drum kit. <laughs> I don't have drums. That's all right. I got a kit. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we're good. I got you covered. <laughs> I love that story. That is such a cool story. That is such an early, um, you know, permanent, you know, like, you know, like look early look into who you were going to be, who you've always been in a way. And that's been the director. You've been very pretty clear, uh, even though you're still, you know, kind of uncovering certain aspects. It feels like you've been very clear from an early age on I got music in me that needs to or needs to come through me, needs to go out and I need to be performing. That is who I am that's what I do and I you're enlisted and you're enlisted and when you can't be here then I'll get another person that's good but all right cool you're out of here good luck next you know like you kind of kept going and all these years later you're still you're still perfecting the craft you know that's cool thank you very much I'm glad that you're, you're really getting it you know it's just mm. a lot of times this this is being misunderstood as I'm so egotistical person but it's really the art comes first the artist comes yeah. first i mean that not the artist the art the art itself you know mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean that's what so I, I i'm curious um there's a whole generation of of pantera fans that know you through this pantera home video where dimebag daryl asked you tried to give you donuts and Everybody, I asked a few, a few of my followers, I said, what do you want me to ask Yngwie about when I talk to him tomorrow? They said, ask him about the donut thing. Cause like, it's weird. Like what does he, did he not know Dimebag Daryl? That, that was it like, was he being a jerk? Was it, what's the deal? Like, do you remember anything about that interaction? It's a really funny thing that you should mention that. Cause <clears throat> I've never seen the clip. I've never seen the clip. I don't remember the incident. He was probably wow. back when I was knocking back a few, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and so I, 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 I'm sure that I didn't mean any th thing specifically, except that I was probably having something else in my mind at the time, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I don't even remember the incident. I've heard of it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they were great band. I, 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 what I've heard from, them, I thought it was, they were awesome, you know, but um, I never, I never uh, thought about it specifically, and I didn't I try to insult anybody. I didn't know who he was at the time. I did, sure. even if I know it was him or so or them. Or, or, I don't even know. I never even seen the clip, so I'm gonna have to. Wow, I'll have to I'll have to dig it up. It's 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 an interesting because there's a it's almost like a meme quality at this appointment. Like Ingve don't like donuts, you know, like, and and they're like. It's just a funny thing for for younger, slightly younger generation that grew up watching their videos, because some of those people, some of those kids, including myself, I mean, I had heard Rising Force, I'd heard a couple, I'd heard Trilogy, but I, I was more into the heavy metal at that time, and so I, I knew your name, but I hadn't studied your music, you know, so I didn't know who you were, I didn't know anything, and it kind of uh, added to the maybe the misconception being misunderstood. <laughs> As a as a player in the in uh, in the grand scheme of things, uh, people going, oh, Inve doesn't he didn't even give Dimebag the the time of day, you know, type of thing. But really, you're just like, I'm going somewhere else, doing something else. I think you were with a girl or something, so you're probably partying, going do something cool, rather than hanging out eating donuts with Pantera. So, no harm, no foul. Uh, yeah, I, see, I, like I said, um. <clears throat> I, I definitely didn't do anything like purposefully saying, oh, these guys suck or something like that. I don't even, I, I, I mean, I've heard them since. I mean, I don't sure. even know what it was. I have no idea when this was. But I've, I've heard them. Uh, in fact, I did an album in 2000, and the engineer would, you, you, would play me stuff. I remember that. I don't remember the name mm. of that. I said, wow, I like this. It's good. But, so you never had any interaction with Dimebag Daryl or any of the band members of Pantera? I don't. We might have done a festival or something together, but you know how those things go. You know, I can't yeah. remember. That's okay. No, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's interesting. Uh, it's just, it's just a little, I had to, I had to ask because my 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 people all ask, and I'm like, okay, man, I won't I won't let you down. I'll ask Ingve about the donut thing. Um, 
But what I'm one of the things I'm really curious about though uh, is your relationship with the guitar pick. Like back when you were, you know, seven years old or whenever you started playing uh, guitar. What do you remember about the first few guitar picks that you were using? And did anybody in particular inspire you? I mean, it sounds like you did a lot of this stuff on your own, but I'm curious about um, what, what you were playing in the early days, what you remember about guitar picks and why you're playing what you're playing now. That is a great question. And I will tell you, when I first picked that guitar up on my, on my wall that I've had for two years or whatever, uh, I took one of those plastic pieces of, like they put the bread together with. Oh, yeah. I used this for a pick. And then that, of course, didn't work so good. <clears throat> so my, my next uh, allowance, I went to a little local store and I bought, I said, I want some guitar picks. I remember they gave me a black pick. It said Django on it, like Django Reinhardt. Whoa. Yeah, this was 1970. <laughs> Long yeah. time. So... Um, and that I kept on using whatever was laying around for quite some time until I realized when, when I tried different ones was that if I did a figure like this is that's legato, right? You want to do that with picking the notes. And it has to be exact, you know? It can't, it can't be one off, one off. Okay, the most important thing with that is that the pick doesn't bend. If the pick bends, you have two brain halves, this hand tells you to do this moment here, like this, and this hand does this. But if the, this bends, there's gonna be a millisecond delay for it to right. so be direct. So these are Dunlop 1.5 millimeter, which I've used now for let me see if you can see this. Oh, I've got one here, actually. Here, oh, you got it. Yeah, I, I did. <laughs> please. Uh, they're amazing. Um, for a short time, many, many years ago, I used to pick made out of stone. Really? Yeah. Uh, like it was made out of uh, some sort of a uh, precious stone, like 1980. When I record okay. that thing, that I used to a uh, stone pick. <laughs> That's how wow. extreme. Yeah, it has to be very. That's very stiff. <laughs> I know, but really, it, it, what was great with it was uh, for for you like you want to do arpeggios, you can't have any sort of nicks in there. It has to be that, mm. and that's by not that's not sweet picking, by the way. It's not. A lot of people think sweet picking is not. So no. So, so the most thing for me is that the pick the not band, you know, and the, the, right the material makes a little difference in the sound too you know i love these these are amazing as long as i've i've known anything about you you've used these delrin 500 1.5s from jim dunlop right so i do you remember like was have they been making your picks for like just decades now or oh my god yeah well long yeah. uh before then i used to use uh Could be fender picks actually, fender. You like fender heavy or something? Yeah, extra heavy, yeah. Extra heavy. But they were a little different material. They were like sort of like a um, little less smooth, you know. Mm, yeah, that's probably celluloid versus this Delrin material. This Delrin material is more slick. Yes, that's what it was. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like a brown tortoise shell, maybe or something like yeah. that. The same shape though. Yeah, that Fender 351 or 751, 351, I think 351. Uh, and so because this pick is stiff and uh, has, it's slippery uh, on, the, on the strings, it allows you to obviously do all this acrobatics, right, on, on, on the, the guitar. And it has real time, there's no latency, is kind of what I hear you saying, like there's no latency. Yeah, yeah, no latency, yes. That's cool. And I'm also curious, uh, because you're one of the few guys on the planet that scallops his fretboard or has his fretboard scalloped. Where did the inspiration come from that? And um, can you speak to like the value of it? Okay, so 
when I was like in eighth grade around there, um, I was basically this, this, the, the high school I went to, they were pretty cool to me, you know. Uh, they would let me, I, I parked my motorcycle inside the school and I wow. went to the little room at the end of the place. I had my hamster. I would come around noontime. I would just <laughs> sit there and play through my amps, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and they would come to me and they said, but you have to go to class. You have to go to class. I'm not, whatever. And uh, I, I, that sometimes I said, yeah, but look at my grades. Straight A's. Wow. Because I, I, if there's a test, yeah, I don't problem. Done, you know. So in any event, they, they, they basically said, if you don't want to go to school, you have to do something else. Because they, they, in Sweden, they didn't have what's called homeschooling or you, you said law was you had to go. So they said there, there's a luthier uh, that, that have apprenticeship. You can go there to luthier and so, so I went there. I was, I, I don't care, probably like 13, 14, maybe. I don't remember. Maybe younger, I don't know. Uh, and it was an old loot that came in and had this, mm. you know. And I used to always build mall ships and planes and stuff. So I, I could, anything with wood, I could just do it. So I, I decided to just carve out the fretboard on one of my less good guitars. And I, I noticed right away what happens is that when you do, Vibrato, you know, it's like, wow, the control, amazing. It's not easy mm. to play fast, but they control the, the vibrato and the bending and so on. So I started doing it, to, and I pretty much started on all of my guitars, pretty deep. You know, the duck, the famous duck guitar. I scalloped mm -hmm. them. That, that's still there. Oh, you did that one yourself? Yeah. That's oh, so yeah. cool. Oh, yeah. I love that. And so that's basically it. And then I, they started, same thing as having really large frets, basically, you know, mm -hmm, but more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But that's, that's, that's a key theme with you too, is more. Biggest Dunlop frets you can get. Mm. I put down the biggest Dunlop, Dunlop, the greatest frets ever, and Dunlop strap locks. Yes. Um, and scallops. So this, it's like you can drive a fucking freight train on top of these things, you know. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm actually a, a fr good friend of mine in a more modern, younger player. This guy, Strat, his name is Stratton Marshall. Like his dad was a big fan of uh, Jimi Hendrix. And he was, I think the story goes, I may be getting this wrong, but it's like uh, he named his son Stratton Marshall because that's what Jimi Hendrix would ask for the Stratton Marshall. And his, his first name, Stratton. S T R A T E N Marshall. And he's a big fan of yours. And he, uh, we just, I, I'm a, I work for Kiesel also. And Kiesel, um, we just started doing scallop frets. And he said, Hey, man, make me a, a cool strat style guitar with scallop frets and uh, full scallop. And he put eights, like a set of eights on there. So super light strings and super deep scallops. He's, he's very much a big fan uh, of, of yours and, uh, and very inspired by you. Um, so it was, it was, I, I just thought you should know this kid out there somewhere is like, you know, got a name named Stratton Marshall. Like it's the thing that you play too, you know? That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, I guess with the, uh, there's the other thing too that I, I actually was, you're kind of noted, noted for having a legendary, like fast rotational picking style. Can you, can you talk about that just a little bit? Like what's involved in that? Is, is there anything that you, did you develop that or did you kind of just catch that from somebody else along the way and, and, and take it further? Great question. When I started from the day I started till, you know, when I realized, you know, that you know, I don't like fuzz pedals, and I like old marshals, and th this happened. You know, it's all described in my book, Relentless. How I found each little step of the equipment chain, so to speak. <clears throat> Along with that was also I heard something, like Paganini's fifth, for instance. You know, like it's like it's it's like a violin technique. Mm. I just heard it. And I wanted to get something similar, like a something similar like that. And I didn't think about what this thing was doing. I didn't really think about what this thing is doing either. I just thought about what I could hear. So from playing from morning to night and falling asleep with the guitar on me and then waking up in the morning with the guitar still on me, just keep on going for 
years and years and years and years and years and always recording it, recording it and then listen back. I, I just developed some sort of technique where, you know, the, the, later on, if people have analyzed my picking, which I never did. And it's like it's got the anchoring and the, the this and that, whatever. And I can remember the day <clears throat> I went to Japan the first time, 1983. Mm. And by this time, uh, my playing was, you know, with Alcatraz and Steeler and all that stuff. <laughs> and the Japanese interviewer goes, oh, how do you hold your pick? I'm like, first time. I look down at my hand. I go, uh, like this, I guess. <laughs> never thought about it not once wow i never oh, i'm gonna do this and i'm gonna do that it was completely natural from just searching for a, what i want to hear and getting that sound that's cool so, that, around like, you know so the, no plus you gotta remember when i started there was no internet there was no guitar magazines there was nothing there was no tablatures and techniques books right. nothing well, that, that's what I think is even more amazing about it is when, when people develop their skills kind of away from uh, uh, the primary influence, the, main, the, the mainstream influence of stuff like in, in, in prior to the Internet and in, in even a lot of televised performances, that's what you, you had to pick it all out by your ear. You're like, what is it that they're doing? How are they getting that sound? And then you'd futz around until you got something similar. Right. Like and then you'd oh, OK. And then you'd move forward in that way versus now we're like you a lot of that work is done for you, which is it's it's interesting that, that the young generation can pop onto YouTube and go, oh, that's how Ingve does the thing. Got it. OK, well, anyway, but they didn't have to work to figure it out. Right. So so there's something so one could say something is lost right in in having it so readily available. Individualism may be lost by that. Hmm. Because, because if you can just readily, you can look at something, something and give you the information, you want to copy something, it might help you. But at the same time, if you would have to start from scratch and go to somewhere where you feel like you're getting somewhere, your individual sound and, and approach is going to be remain individual, you know, instead of something that is reminiscent. That's the that's the, that's the that's the drawback with that. Yeah, yeah. I think I, that's that's kind of the, what I'm pointing at is, and I mean, I mean, it's not that there aren't there are players developing unique styles even today. Obviously, there are plenty of them, but uh, I guess there, in some ways, you know, it's I would say, in my viewpoint, maybe it's like know when to say when around like copying other people's technique and styles and spend more time on your instrument developing you know what needs to come through you like listening to what needs to come through because i think earlier times kind of forced that upon us and and you're kind of describing that you're saying like i didn't have like a ready-made guy right next door to me that was like teaching me all this all the base how to hold a pick and how to do this you had musical experience and then you just like experimented until you found your way on it right I'm not, not, look, what I meant to say about individualism, I didn't say that there's no that there aren't any good new players. I'm sure there's hundreds of sure. them. Yeah, I didn't say that. What I was saying is <clears throat> in in the development, the approach of a development, it's like learning how to walk, a little kid. You know, you, you could put him in like some sort of a uh, helping, you gotta let him fall down a couple of times. Mm. I mean, that's just the way it is. You, you, that's how you get to where you need to be. If you just learn to run before you walk, you might lose something with that. That's all I yeah, said. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And sp it's speaking of, of, of newer players, like I've seen you a few times on the Generation Axe tour um, and it was phenomenal. I really love the contrast of players on that tour. Um, and I'm curious about your experience on a tour like that, uh, hanging out with Vi and Zach and Tosin and Nuno, like, I mean, you guys are all very super varied players and all like very well known in your own right. Um, and, and, and strangely enough, Vi being, you know, 
of a similar era to you, you know, and all this stuff too, but developing in different capacities, working with Zappa and all this stuff. Like how, how does it feel a, to be uh, included in such a cool lineup? Obviously you're, you're a top shelf player that Vi would, would, you know, it, feels very uh, strongly about so that's why you're there and and why you guys are all hanging out but like you as a player kind of developing almost outside of that circle in a way I, I wonder about like how you feel about the those that type of tour and then like a player like say like Tosin Abasi like what is that what does he, his thing do for you if anything wow okay uh first of all Steve and I are like we go back to the early eighties, you know, we've known each other since forever. You know, when, when I left Alcatraz, he joined Alcatraz. We had the same manager. So I knew Steve from way back. <clears throat> and Nuno and Zach have known on and off like to be like that. But now of course I know him very well from all his touring. And mm -hmm. Tosin, I didn't really know about. So when I started listening to him, his stuff is crazy cool, man. It is really nuts. He did something totally original. So kudos for that, um, Steve, of course. But Steve, Steve, um, I think me developing my way of doing what I was doing in, in a very far away European place might mm -hmm. have played a role into what I was doing because of, you know, the, the, basically bathing in classical music when I was a kid, you know. Uh, Versus, I think Steve was more, he, he, the Zappa thing was a big thing for him, you know. So, I mean, that he's got two unique, unique style too. And Zach, we all know, is like the, the ultimate monster pentatonic player. Nuno yeah. is great. It's got a really organic tone, you know. It's, it's great that <clears throat> we, we have, like you said, it's, that show <clears throat> is very um, varied. Which is hard to do. Yeah. So, to be a little bit samey sometimes but not not, not us <laughs> not that group at all man like it was it was a clear it's it's such a clear uh difference between each player but then you guys come and jam together and you know that's really cool too yeah no we had that's a blast every time that's awesome i i wonder um about i just i was like you know i, I just in that group you are the number one guy with amps. I mean, I know that like Nuno and Zach and even Vi still mess with amps and stuff, but like, you're like the diehard two band Marshall guy that like actually ha that brings like lots of live heads and cabinets with you are all, I assume that they're all live. I don't know if that's the case or not, but I don't know. I don't imagine you bringing dummy cabs. But... What? What? <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh, uh, that's uh, when I go out with those guys I have a little mini stack it's like 26 mm. when I go <laughs> do my own, when I do my own thing I have 54 heads holy shit 54 what? Lexis <laughs> are they all 50 waters is that because 50 is 50 water your favorite or what are the hundreds I have 50s and I have the Super Lead 100s, and I have my model YGM 100, which is based on a Super Lead 100, but you could switch it to a 50 if you want. I've been using mm. the last 20 years. That's awesome. I and so, I, but Marshall, no, I can't hear it. <laughs> it's like, I guess the, that that's just like the, it's the recipe, right? And, and you've probably been tweaking it a little bit through the years, but you've had a very similar setup for all this time. Is there anything that has, has drastically changed in the, in like the last 30, 40 years with your. Well, when, I, when I was in Sweden, I would use, I would, <clears throat> you know, I love Van Halen, right? But I, mm -hmm. I refused to hack my guitar up with a humbucker in it. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it. No, not doing that. And I didn't want to do it all day long either. Even as much as I love Van Halen. <clears throat> I didn't want to be Van Halen. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry. So basically what happened was in 1975, I was like 11 years old. Marshall put out the master volume Marshall, 
which is you can have distortion with the low volume. All of a sudden, the four input marshals, the flexes, are worth like 50 bucks. Wow. So now they're worth $5,000. But anyways, so, so, so I said, wow, this is great. I would, I would go and trade like a, like a fuzz pedal for a, a, for a Marshall head. <laughs> Somebody would give me a Marshall head for, a, for, a, for the stupidest things, for like $30. They were just collecting dust. And I would start building up the most. And nobody wanted the gray cabinets either. They wanted black cabinets. So I liked the gray, gray cabinets. So I was just building up these stacks. I had like, I, there's a video online of me live, 1981 in Sweden. Mm. you know and i had smoke machines and i had like huge marshall stacks double bass drums and everything same same exact thing you know but, I, but even before then i was doing that and so i realized uh i can't get these things to sound good unless they're all the way up so it's very loud mm. but what i did realize also when i compared it to, to what the master volume was were that um if you have the, the preamp and the power amp working in a non-literal fashion. In other words, the preamp is working all the way up, but the, 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 the AL-34s are hardly working. You lose a lot of you know, power. So when you have the signal going linear through the, the preamp and the power amp working exactly the same, you get a sound that that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants to copy. That's the sound, you know? And um, so if you take a, a, a power soak, like a, like a, it's called a, a power break from Marshall and put it behind amp. So the amp is working all the way up and you put it behind, you can turn it down. I don't like that personally, but you can. But if you turn down the volume, no good. So you have to be all the way up. And uh, instead of a fuzz box, I used what's called an overdrive pedal. I, I bought it in 1978 or something. Uh, from a company called DOD 250. And that now I'm using a Fender pedal that is, I designed with them. It's called the Mounts in Overdrive. It's really amazing, you know. But the, the concept is the same. And so when I also, when I grew up in Sweden, I used the single coils. But when I came to America, I realized they hum a lot because it's different power here. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually got uh, a, a company called uh, a company to make a pickup. Instead of like this, like this, stack. Oh, nice. Take two coils, put them on top of each other. Wait, was that the early DiMarzio set that you had? But I did, they made one, Aegis one. I said, no, nah, I don't like it. They made Aegis two. I, I don't like it. They made Aegis three. I don't like it. Well, that's all we can do. So for 20 years, I used to pick up I didn't like. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And then in 2008, I had a uh, uh, Seymour Duncan come to me and said, we'll make you whatever you want. And they would make me pick up and I would be putting the guitar here in the studio and I would say, it has a little less, a little, little more brightness, a little more this stuff, whatever. And they need 39 versions. So in other Whoa. words, I was called ages 39 then, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, the, these pickups are amazing. Seymour Duncan. That's cool, so, man. That's that's really interesting to hear uh, that you suffered with pickups that you weren't really that happy with for so long. The only reason, because I couldn't deal with a hum. I didn't like the hum. Mm. So in order to not to get the hum, I had to sacrifice the sound. Right, right. But not anymore. I mean, not anymore. No, you got the setup now. Like it's all like. Well, that's what I love hearing is that like really you've you've stayed the course through all the years you've kept the marshals you found different ways to to better utilize them as the technology was available uh you had the the cool boost pedal back in the day that went obsolete so you worked with fender to make a new one you know you, your pickups weren't quite right so duncan perfected that for you and the guitar is still out there and it's still legendary and people are still buying that guitar right because it's so synonymous with your playing and it's such an honor you know because i remember i was playing in 1986, I was, well, actually, uh, in 1984, when my first solo album, came, solo album came out with this guitar in front, well, not this one, but, uh, you know, nobody used a Strat for single calls. They just didn't. That And uh, regular tremolo, you know? And mm. all of a sudden, they became kind of popular again. It was, it was a great thing. So Fender came to me, and they said, 
I had turned down every guitar company in the world because I was getting a little hot, you know. Mm -hmm. So every guitar company came to me, even Gibson. <clears throat> I said, thanks, but no thanks. I'd rather buy a Fender Strat than getting it, you know. <laughs> I was very <laughs> particular. And I said to myself, I, I'm never going to get a free Strat because Fender don't do that. They never gave free Strats to Beck and Hendrix and Blackmore, nobody. And so Dan Smith came to me and he said, <clears throat> not only do you want to give your guitar free, but want to make one with your name on it. And it was 1986. Mm. Wow. Yes. Long Beach Arena, California, 1986. They came and I had a 1956 guitar and a 1961 guitar. And they came with calipers and this and that. <clears throat> and they said, um, oh, we probably can't have a scallop. So well, don't, don't, don't do it then. <laughs> <laughs> I was being really cocky. I was kind of half joking. And um, so, but they said they did, and, and they started it then, and it came out in '87. So they did the scallops anyway. Yes, I remember I was in the studio in Texas, Austin, Texas. I was recording um, Odyssey, and Stan Smith came with a prototype guitar to the studio, and mm. I didn't even change the strings. I just plugged it in, and that's guitar solo I'm having tonight with that guitar. Oh, sick. <laughs> So they were perfect from the beginning. Yeah. That's awesome. That, that I love, I love hearing that. I love that. I love it when uh, a company recognizes talent like that and you were in, yeah, you were, uh, you know, a rising uh, star. I mean, you were already actually a star at that point. And, uh, and, but it, it's, it's interesting when, when a company goes and breaks their own kind of like normal thing and they go well you know we we don't normally do this but we're gonna do it for you and i bet that's probably felt like incredible to have them show up and be like you're the man huge honor huge honor well Inve, i want to ask you uh one more major question um major question one more main question and that is just i'm curious about like what you listen to these days like as just for for pleasure like uh do you listen to a lot of other guitar music or do you try to like listen to other things to kind of keep you away from that so that you stay inspired for your own music. Like what's, what's your thing? And is there any players or any music that you might share with us that we could check out? Well, it's, it's, it's a funny thing with, I guess when you, when you are, uh, I don't know how to compare it to, but whatever you do, as, as a, uh, being a creative person, you, that something that you're, I cannot listen to music in, in a background, like in a, you know, a store or something without analyzing it. As I'm a producer, I would go, oh, this, the, I wonder if you use 1176 on the snare drum, that, that, and the bottom snare mic is a little too high. Um, I want to put a little more 6K on the kick drum there. Or, or the, that reverb, they, that, that's pretty nice, but they should have used um, three milliseconds delay on top. Nothing comes, you know, it, it's, it's, I'm very analytical about that because that's what I do. So when, when I uh, don't work, so to speak, I don't tend to listen to music as like um, entertainment, you know, I don't have to mm. do no, no music really. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think that's good for me because it, it doesn't inadvertently influence me, number one. And it makes the music that I, when, when I plug in and, and sound feel a little more exciting, you know. By saying that, I'm not knocking anything because, I mean, I love all sorts of things. I, I love, of course, the classic bands like Queen and ACDC and Purple and all those bands. I love them, mm -hmm. you know. But I don't listen to them, you know. I don't hardly listen to classical music either. Um, especially when I come off of making a record like this, when you're so immersed in 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 making it, you know, I mean, it's like now, like Enzo Ferrari said, the music we put radios in our cars, but the real music comes from the engine, you know. So mm -hmm. when I drive, usually comes around that. But um, I I can't really say anything. Mention something, you know, new. It's more like an old thing that I would mention. But uh, old old things are good too recommend something what would what would you tell what would you tell young uh players that are 
uh, interested in carving out their own thing and getting schooled on some some cool music. Maybe it's a classical piece or something. Who? What should we look? Where? What are some pieces or some composers we should look look to? As far as as far as just being exposed to what I call a god particle, you know, um, <laughs> Johann Sebastian Bach, anything by him. If you want to listen to some really cool rock and roll, you're gonna love this. It's Emerson Lake and Palmer. Mm. Or very early Genesis records from uh, 1970s uh, with Peter Gable. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, you have your Zeppelin and Purple and all that stuff. We all know that's great. You know, Queen. Mm -hmm. uh, but Van Halen, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's timeless. That's timeless. And, and, and you know, God, God rest Eddie's soul, man. What a, what a phenomenal human being and and an incredible inspiration to uh, millions you know um thankful that that we lived on the planet at the same time as that guy exactly well you know it's funny i just real quick it's funny you said god particle because i had written down here in my notes that that was the track that i was enjoying the most off of the new album wow so i didn't have to even say anything you said you know look when you're searching for a god particle <laughs> that's cool that, that's that's the track i've been listening to the most but uh man uh thank you so much for for chopping it up and taking some time um the, the listeners are going to be really happy uh to hear all these great stories and and have some insight in how you think and 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 how you perceive what it is that you do um and i will just say uh for the listeners out there uh don't forget to check out ingve's book relentless right that's the memoir that's out there. It's been out for a while now, but it's uh, but it but it's a good read, and you should check it out. And the new the new uh, uh, release, Parabellum. The name Parabellum. The na name of the record is Parabellum. Uh, but Parabellum is from Nascot Records, and uh, you can make it a double double vinyl. The uh, so cool. I made it that yeah. even inside the record. Uh, I mean. Uh, the front cover is a painting that was all my wife's idea, but um, it's for charity and everything. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But inside, all the pictures like they're like in the old days, you know. It's cool. I like that. I like, and I mean, I love. I, I I would love to get the vinyl too because uh, that's that's one of the things that I I I miss about modern music is the double, picking it. Double. Yeah, I, opening it up, having lyrics, having artwork, having seeing who played on what and. I love that stuff. That's, that's it's all in there. All in there. Cool. Well, thanks again, brother. I hope you have a great day and let's stay in touch. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Players Pick Podcast Picks and Perspective with Chris Johnson.